Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Continuing uh, with the opening of the eyes, we now sh see uh, Nitrin shifting his focus a little bit. Uh, let me adjust the camera just a tad here. Okay. And uh, he kind of seamlessly flows this into... Uh, this diatribe that he's had about um, bad influences and and uh, evil teachers and uh, again keeping in mind that this is all uh, to really observe our own minds right this is Buddhism Buddhism is about how does our mind work how do we get sucked into certain tendencies and conditions and how do we avoid them? How do we influence our uh, influence our lives from moment to moment, past, present, and future being past moment, present moment, future moment, right? So now he's going to shift into how we should view and uh, conform our resolute mind. How do we practice Buddhism? How do we do this? And he's going to use himself as an example in uh, uh, 13th century Japan um, to remind his students, his followers, if you will, disciples, basically we're all students of Buddhism. So his students uh, harboring doubts and fears in their day, as I've described before, uh, they need reassurance from uh, their their high priest, their their teacher, their sensei, their sifu. Um, so, I will continue and uh, interrupt as I usually do <laughs> to make sure that uh, we understand this translation of this story, of this teaching of Nichiren's and... Uh, Shakyamuni. So, where we left off, we were talking about slandering of the Lotus Sutra, which, right off the bat, I have to tell you, there are, you know, in the contemporary sense, we talk about slander as being very person-oriented, um, speaking poorly or writing poorly of another person to behave in a way that impugns their character, if you will. When we talk in in these writings and teachings about slander of the Lotus Sutra, what we're slandering or what is being meant or charged here is that the teachings themselves are being um, subverted or uh, challenged in an inappropriate way. But that doesn't only apply, and this is this is going to come in handy to understand what's going to happen here. Um, it's not just, uh, as the discussion has been so far, those who write their own treatises or misinterpret or willingly misinterpret or uh, skew the meaning of uh, uh, of teachings uh, toward their their own ends, their own preferred uh, ends, which may be either for their own profit or their own gain somehow uh, to, to gain authoritarian power over uh, the teachings. But this also is a personal battle, and this is the shift that's going to take place as, a, as we get into this, um, that the slander of the Lotus Sutra is the slander of the law. And the slander of the law is the law that ultimately says and is uh, uh, fully described or, or uh, not discovered, what's the word I'm looking for, fully uh, developed and, and, um, and displayed and offered 
in the Lotus Sutra, above all others, is that all of us are already Buddha, uh, have Buddhahood within our structure, within our minds. But it is our human condition, the, uh, our, our condition of tendencies and conditions, our, our, our human mind, which acts as uh, a constant obstacle to the clarity of what we already have uh, in our minds, our Buddha mind, uh, our enlightenment, our awakening. It simply needs to be revealed. It doesn't need to be attained so much as uh, something we don't have and uh, work toward having, but that uh, we already have it. Uh, it's simply a matter of discarding uh, the veils of misunderstanding that prohibit us uh, from seeing our Buddha mind clearly. And uh, over and over again, throughout all of the teachings, these veils are described in various ways, whether they be misunderstandings or uh, attachments. You've heard that word a lot, right? Um, avarice, greed, all the emotive things of human nature are things that, or um, activities, more accurately, that uh, act as... Uh, not a bad influence, but I keep coming to the word veils. They obfuscate, you know, these these wanting the new car, the wanting the perfect relationships, the wanting more money, uh, the 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 shiny thing, the 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 desires that we have in our human existence become such a preoccupation that they actually block our clear vision of what would otherwise be uh, absolute liberation from those desires and a, a beautiful recognition of this I intensely precious uh, life moment, these, these moments that we can share and, and experience of life utterly without these preoccupations, these... these uh, uh, diversions, these attractions that that quickly surmount our greater clarity and vision of the preciousness of life and defile that by just putting these these immediate gratifications in our in the forefront of our minds. Does that make sense? So if we allow those to take precedence, to occupy us wholly, which they do very quickly in our mind, um, then we are slandering that, that law. We are slandering the lotus. We are slandering our own enlightenment because in lieu of this perfection of vision and beauty, and experience, we choose instead these very temporary, ephemeral pleasures that that are very fleeting and bring us very momentary experiences of joy, uh, excitement, and satisfactions. And and how we can let those things come in the way of a full experience of life is the conundrum of our human existence, isn't it? And this is exactly what Buddha discovered three, almost 3,000 years ago and what all of these teachings are trying to get us to sort through. Okay? The pre-Lotus Sutra and even the beginning of the Lotus Sutra, that teaching is about these ways of understanding the way the human mind absconds with our enlightenment in favor of all these immediate gratifications when in fact all along we have our perfect enlightenment laid out in front of us everywhere, every moment, all the time. We simply choose 
in samsara, in our human mind, to be preoccupied with immediate things, which I would even go so far as to say that if you take the position of Nietzsche in here, that the immediate thing of enlightenment, the immediate beauty and and, and the unsurmountable experience of being alive in being awakened and enlightened is far surpasses any of those little foibles of of uh, whether it's food, sex, show, whatever those desires and, and and greeds and so forth are, all those emotive, immediate gratifications are. But we spent so long building this huge database of desires that we we can't even see through them well enough to perceive that awakened, enlightened state. This is why we chant. This is why we use a gohonzon. This is the great invention of Nichiren. By using a mirror, a perfect mirror of the lotus teachings, focusing on it and chanting, we can open that that pathway and, with, and establish some clarity, some experience of that moment of awakening so that we start to desire it above and beyond those immediate gratification desires to the point when we can actually accomplish it, be in that moment, be in myoho renge kyo, be in the awakened, enlightened moment, then it becomes much easier uh, to live within it. But we are, and in final analysis, still human. So we we quickly become attached. We are in an environment, after all, and we quickly lose our focus on our Buddha mind. And so this is why this is a practice, because it is a day-to-day -day endeavor to be in that enlightened, awakened state for more and more, longer and longer periods of time, and less and less influenced by our constant surrounding of immediate gratification, right? So, um, spoiler alert, that's what this part of opening of the eyes is about. And so let's get into it and it'll make more sense as I go. Next, we should note that persons who are in, in, inevitably destined to fall into hell in their next existence, even though they commit grave offenses in this life, will suffer no immediate push, punishment. The Inchantinkas are examples of this. Their nirvana, so again, very quickly, inevitably destined to fall into hell in their next existence is a Western translation of an idea of living moment to moment. And in the very next moment, by being attached to or or slandering our our own enlightened nature or or very directly the teachings of the lotus or or to do anything that's counter to our achieving and or somebody else achieving enlightenment and awakening our next moment will be uh, an instantiation of exactly that you know if you work hard or you work with intent to uh make a meal that's being prefer prepared for you seem as though it is sickening and bad and shouldn't be eaten, then the likelihood in this teaching is that your next moment, will, you will start to feel sickened. You will start to lose a sense of health. You will, you will influence your life condition in the same way that you are repelling what is good for you. Does that make sense? So, even though they commit grave offenses in this life, will suffer no immediate punishment, is saying that, uh, for instance, in the time that we live now, in the time of great greed, avarice, anger, and stupidity, that it's so pervasive in, in our environments that... Uh, it may seem as though uh, 
some evils, uh, whether they be people or actions or activities, uh, seem to go on without repercussion. How do they get away with being that way? How do I get away with being that way, right? Those kind of questions. Um, and nothing happens to them. Nothing seems to ever happen to them. Well, this is what Nietzsche is talking about. He's saying that when, when this, in an evil age, when it's so pervasive that it may seem as though they don't, but that's not the actual fact. They're just storing up a big ball of lava and it, it, will, it will affect them. But we know from the lotus that even then we can surmount, right? And so this is provisional teachings he's talking about here. Because as we learn later in the Lotus Sutra, even Devadatta, somebody who scorned the Buddha himself, was later to attain enlightenment. Because it's already here. Do you, do you see the seesaw that we're on in these teachings? So here we go. I'm just going to go through it. The Nirvana Sutra states, quote, Bodhisattva Kashyapa said to the Buddha, quote, World honored one. As you have described, the rays of the Buddha's great nirvana enter the pores of all living beings. End quote. It also says, quote, Bodhisattva Kashyapa said to Buddha, World honored one, how can those who have not yet conceived a desire for enlightenment create the causes that will lead to enlightenment? End quote. In reply, the Buddha said to Kashyapa, There may be persons who listen to the Nirvana Sutra and yet claim that they have no need to conceive of a desire for enlightenment and instead slander the correct teachings. Remember the slander I've told you about? Such persons will immediately dream at night of demons, and their hearts will be filled with terror. The demons will say to them, quote, How foolish you are, my friend, my friend. The demons say, my friend. Influences. If you do not set your mind on enlightenment now, your lifespan will be cut short. These persons quake with fear, and soon as they awake from the dream, set their minds on enlightenment. And you should know that such persons will become great bodhisattvas. So, is he speaking here of an actual night terror? Sure, we can use that device. To illustrate, what he illustrates in the next line is that people, when they awaken from that behavior, that bad behavior of of um, nurturing their emotions and their desires instead of their higher potentials, um, these people, when once they awaken from that, when we chant and we first get a seed of our own enlightenment and awakening and we experience it, we're much more motivated to seek it out. This is what we mean by creating resolve, greater determination in our practice. So this is what he's talking about here. In other words, and this is from the Nirvana Sutra. This is Nietzsche, and he's quoting the Sutra. In other words, although one might slander the correct teaching, if one does not uh, d is not an unspeakably evil person, one will be warned at once in a dream and will have a change of heart. So Nietzsche, in, the, in his own way, is trying to say, do you understand? The teaching isn't saying that this is a specific dream. This is a a pattern of behavior that is dreamlike. Life is dreamlike. And if you follow this pattern of behavior constantly uh, romantically involved with your desires and your emotions, and then uh, at, at some point your own, your own life will warn you, will say, this, this isn't it, this can't be it. And whether you, as he said in, in the quote earlier, whether you read the sutra or not, you will be warned. Your life will tell you. Why is that, do you think? Because enlightenment is already there. Your enlightenment is always trying to influence you. It's just, it's not as loud as the human mind of, of distractions and emotions and desires. It's quiet. It's quietude. So it doesn't scream and yell at you. It just looks for moments to reach out to you and go, you don't need to be doing that. Do we? Are we deaf to it? Can we hear it? Can we listen to it? This is 
again, why we chant, why we have Gohanzen, so that we can open our hearing, open our pores, open our minds to this greater potential that we have. According to the Nirvana Sutra, the Ichantikas, on the other hand, are likened to dead trees or stony mountains that can never bring forth growth. They are scorched seeds that, although they encounter the sweet rain, will not grow. Bright pearls have the power, when put into turbid water, to change it into clear, but when thrown into the mud of Ichantika, they cannot purify it. They are like persons without a wound on their hands, when the sutra says if a person with a wound on his hands handles poison, it will enter his body, but will not enter the body of a person without wounds. Just as torrents... i am run out of time. Um, we'll pause real quick and we'll get this video going again. Okay, sorry about that pause. If a person with wounds on his hands... Um, handles poison it will enter his body but will not enter the body of a man without or a person without a wound just as torrents of rain cannot remain suspended in the sky so the rain of the law cannot remain in the sky of Ichantika. through the uh, through these various similes we can know that each antikas of the most evil type will invariably fall into the hell of incessant suffering in their next life therefore they do not suffer any immediate punishment in this life. They are like the evil rulers of the ancient China, King Chia of Xia uh, dynasty and King Chou of the Yin dynasty. During their reigns, heaven did not display any unusual manifestations as a warning. That was because their offenses were so grave that their dynasties were already de destined to perish. So you see, this he touches on a much greater thing here, which he'll make reference to uh, um, another treatise of his, a very important treatise, the Rishon Kokoran. Um, he, he transcends personal practice here, and he, what he's saying is those that uh, seem to get away with evil deeds their whole life long without retribution um, do so because the influence not of theirs although they would think so because ego drives everything, but the influence of their great age is so polluted that everybody is just as guilty as the leader of being evil, of being evil in the sense that they're just completely uh, overtaken by their greed, their avarice, their stupidity, their, 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 uh, their anger, their manipulations. They're, they're very, very attached to their human emotive ego realities. And so the whole age of that person is so destined to do as an individual does, influence itself into corruption and suffering, that uh, it isn't until that entire epoch is expiated that a new opportunity for growth can happen, uh, personal growth, uh, realization, enlightenment. Uh, but that's not to say that the individuals within that society can't, ha can't attain enlightenment, which is what we find later in the Lotus Sutra as uh, all of us have the Buddha nature innately within our the very fact that we are here uh, instantiated as humans. It's part of our, uh, bad analogy, but it's part of our DNA, if you will. Okay. Uh, third, it would appear that the guardian deities have deserted this country, and this is probably one reason why offenders do not suffer an, any immediate punishment. In an age that slanders the law, guardian deities will take their leave, and the various heavenly gods will cease to lend their protection. That is why the votaries of the correct teaching do not receive any sign of divine favor, but on the contrary, encounter severe difficulties. The Golden Light Sutra says, quote, Those who perform good deeds day by day languish and dwindle in number. We are living in an evil country and an evil age. I have discussed all of this in detail in my work entitled On Establishing the Correct Teaching for the Peace of the Land, the Rishon Kokuran. That is another one that we will take on, um, and it is quite 
a large uh, gosho or treatise, as you might imagine, uh, just as this one is. Uh, this I will state, he goes on, let the gods forsake me. Let all persecutions assail me. Still, I will give my life for the sake of the law. Shariputra practiced the way of the Bodhisattva for sixty kalpas, but he abandoned the way because he could not endure the ordeal of the Brahmin who begged for his eyes. Of those who received the seeds of Buddhahood in the remote past and those who did so from the sons of the Buddha, great universal wisdom excellence, many abandoned the seeds and suffered in hell for the long periods of numberless major world system dust particle kalpas and major world system dust particle kalpas respectively because they followed evil companions. Whether tempted by good or threatened by evil, if one casts aside the Lotus Sutra, the teachings of the Lotus Sutra, one destines oneself for hell. So there it is, very plainly said. Here I will make a great vow. Though I might be offered the rulership of Japan, if I would only abandon the Lotus Sutra, accept the teachings of the Meditation Sutra, and look forward to rebirth in the Pure Land, Though I might be told that my father and mother will have their heads cut off if I do not recite the Nimbutsu, whatever obstacles I might encounter, so long as persons of wisdom do not prove my teachings to be false, I will never yield. All other troubles are no more to me than dust before the wind. So, one could argue that this is in a back doorway, an experience of enlightenment and awakening. By, by stating that his very presence in Japan and his clear alacrity of understanding of the teachings of Buddha and Buddhism, and as they are culminated in the Lotus Sutra, that all beings are enlightened, they need only look. They need only resolve themselves to experience and be at one with that Buddha mind in order to escape the sufferings of day-to-day -day life. He is saying here that all of these sufferings, no matter how great they become, I will, I am making a vow, I am saying to you that I will see all of those sufferings as mere dust in the wind. There, there's simply nothing relative to, to the, the, the liberation, the joy, the emancipation of awakening and our Buddha mind. I will be the pillar of Japan, he says. I will be the eyes of Japan. I will be the great ship of Japan. This is my vow, and I will never forsake it. So, this is a great statement he's making to all of his students and followers. He's giving them great reassurance, but he's also being simply a humble, personal embodiment of what he's saying. He's saying, look, I'm not just playing lip service here. I'm not just quoting chapter and verse. I am being it. You can use me as an example but I do not do this to be an example. I do this simply to be this teaching. I am being what I'm saying. I'm saying what I do, and I'm doing what I say. No easy feat. So this is quite an important part, and that's why I wanted to spend some time describing it, of the opening of the eyes. Now we go, he goes again into his question and answer motif because he's anticipating with this great of a statement some people are going to have some questions for me, right? So, question. How can you be certain that the exiles and sentences of death imposed on you are the result of karma created in the past? So that's that question might seem like it comes out of nowhere. But you have to you have to be careful to understand the language here in its entirety because then this won't seem like such a surprise. Why karma has come up suddenly? Why? 
Well, because karma is all of those other activities. When we get involved in our emotive states, our, our, our distractions, our attachments, our um, all of those things motivate us to act. That act has an intent. That intent acts on a predisposition toward our desires, our immediate gratification, right? So in Buddhism, that is creating karma. That is creating inertia. Think of karma as inertia, right? And so if your inertia is constantly moving you toward um, uh, bad habits, uh, immediate gratification, those kinds of things, it conversely is at the very same time moving you away from your enlightenment, from your awakening, from your liberation of those things. Do you see? It's not one or the other. They are one and the other. Cause, effect, same thing. This is karma. So when the questioner says, uh, you say that all these uh, uh, bad things that are happening to you are, are a proof uh, that um, you're a votary of the Lotus Sutra, that you're practicing correctly. Um, how do you know uh, that um, that these are a proof? In other words, the result of karma created in the past are your actions, your actions to promote the Lotus Sutra, to promote the correct teachings of Buddhism, to promote awakening and enlightenment in this lifetime of creating the Gohonzon, of creating Daimoku, of a way, a channel, a simple method for anyone, no matter what their state of life, to attain their Buddhahood, their Buddha nature. How do you know that that is what's bringing on all of this Misery toward you, right? The karma, the causes you've made, your actions. Follow? So, answer. A bronze mirror will reflect color and form. The first emperor of Qin dynasty had a lie-detecting mirror that would reveal offenses committed in his present life. The mirror of the Buddha's law makes clear the causal actions committed in the past. The Parinirvana Sutra states, quote, Good man, because people committed countless offenses and accumulated such evil karma in the past, they must expect to suffer difficulty for everything they have done. They may be despised, cursed with an ugly appearance, be poorly clad and poorly fed, seek wealth in vain, be born to an impoverished and lowly family, or one with erroneous views, or be persecuted by their sovereign, they may be subjected to various other sufferings and difficulties. It is due to the blessings obtained by protecting the law that they can diminish in this lifetime their sufferings and difficulty. This sutra passage and my own experience tally exactly. By now, all the doubts that I have raised earlier should be dispelled, and thousands of difficulties are nothing to me. Let me show you phrase by phrase how the text applies to me. Quote, they may be despised, or as the Lotus Sutra says, people will despise, hate, envy, or bear grudges against them. And in exactly that manner, I have been treated with contempt and arrogance for over 20 years. The, they may be cursed with an ugly appearance. They may be poorly clad. These two apply to me. They may be poorly fed. That applies to me. They may seek wealth in vain. That applies to me. They may be born in an impoverished and lowly family. He was born to a fisherman's family. That applies to me. They may be persecuted by a sovereign. Can, be, can there be any doubt that the passage applies to me? The Lotus Sutra says again and again, we will be banished. And the passage from the Parinirvana Sutra says, they may be subjected to various other sufferings and difficulties. These passages also apply to me. <sighs> The passage also says it is due to the blessings obtained by protecting the law that they can diminish in this lifetime their suffering and difficulty. End quote. The fifth volume of the Great Concentration and Insight has this to say on the subject. Quote, the feeble merits produced by a mind only half intent on the practice cannot alter the realm of karma. But if one carries out the practice of concentration and insight so as to observe health and illness, 
Then one can alter the cycle of birth and death in the realm of karma. It also says, as practice progresses and understanding grows, the three obstacles and four devils emerge in confusing form, vying with one another to interfere. Now, that's an incredibly port, important part that would bear rereading. Um, sorry, I keep watching the clock on this timer because I only have these chunks of time I can use to uh, make these videos. Sorry. Um, but this is important because he, he says it very clearly here. The, if, you're, if your practice is uh, weak, if you're doing it out of, if you're, if you're sitting down and chanting or, or even going to Gohansen, uh, or maybe you don't even open the Gohansen, maybe you just chant a few minutes every day, or you look at your Butsudan and you chant, and you go, well, that's good enough. Uh, you know, that'll get me there. Um, well, then it's going, it's going to take a very long time for you to make significant impact on your tendencies and conditions. And you may actually become very disenchanted with the practice because you'll say, well, my life isn't changing. I'm stuck. And I'm, I'm still suffering. This isn't working, right? So in Ten Dai's time, he said, look, if you do this with real, real resolve on attaining your enlightenment, on being at one with your Buddha nature, this means regardless of health or illness, don't just chant for health. Accept that health and illness are just, they're part of the dusts in the wind. They're just, those are part of the human experience. Don't, don't focus on that. That's a distraction. That's an attachment. Just look for awakening, enlightenment, Buddha mind. Resolve yourself to that that is the determination that will make everything else fade. And that that is what he's saying. This will alter the cycle of birth and death in the realm of karma. The cycle of birth and death is the moment-to-moment reinstantiation of our tendencies, emotions, ego, so on and so forth. All our desires, all our distractions. To, to get in the way of, to, to influence us, to break that pattern, which happens constantly, requires real effort, real focus, determined focus, resolve. That's what breaks the chains of karma. That's when your life changes. And you'll know it. You'll know it. It also says, as practice progresses and understanding grows, how does practice progress and understanding grow? Broken record, study. Study. The three obstacles and four devils emerge in confusing forms. Yeah, they, they, these are all the, the skillful we means and devices of explaining how your own mind gets in your way, your own desires, your own avarice, that, that karma, that cause and effect train, that moment to moment constant carrying of ego and emotions and desires and attachments. It, 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 it overwhelms. From the beginningless past, I have been born countless times as an evil ruler who, despire, who, who deprived the votaries of the Lotus Sutra of their robes and rations, their fields and crops, much as the people of Japan in the present day go about destroying the temples dedicated to the Lotus Sutra. Do you see the analogy there? He's using foodstuffs and the stuff of humanity, and he's comparing it to the teaching of the Lotus Sutra, one to one. In addition, countless times I've cut off the heads of votaries of the Lotus Sutra, some of these grave offenses I've already paid for. But there must be one, some that are not paid for yet. Even if I seem to have paid for them all, there are still ill effects that remain. When the time comes for me to transcend the sufferings of birth and death, it will be only after I've completely freed myself from these grave offenses. My merits are insignificant, but these offenses are grave. So he, he's being very humble here. He's saying, I don't even know. I don't even know 
what my offenses have been. Uh, the ones that I do know, uh, again, thinking about that is just a distraction. So he's saying, look, given the kinds of persecutions I'm going through, uh, there, there must be an equal, if not greater amount of, of uh, avarice and ego that I must have instantiated in my life to this date in order for me to have to go through such obstacles. At very least, and this is more important, his time and place in Japan is a time when the country and the civilization is at odds with human life. It really is super authoritarian. You know, we're, the world is sort of shifting toward that again right now in our present day in 2020. Uh, and, and, and so that in itself is offensive to awakening, to enlightenment, to our Buddha nature. So he is carrying that burden in his promulgation of the Lotus Sutra and the correct teachings. So we'll continue next time. Um, this just keeps getting more interesting. So appreciate your being here with me. Thank you so much. Good luck to your practice. Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. Be resolved. Find your Buddha nature. Be at one with it. Thank you.